And we are back. It is now time for our third session of the day. We now have a fireside chat on the evolution of end user computing, improving the patient experience. As a reminder, if you do want to submit a question during this session, please utilize that chat functionality within the Zoom platform. We will get to as many questions as we possibly can. Okay, now I would love to bring back on to the uh, the virtual stage here, Mark Haglin, our editor in chief, to moderate this fireside chat. Mark, take it away. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for returning uh, to rejoin us. It's my pleasure and my honor to welcome Michael Pagonis from Nutanix, and we're going to talk about the patient experience. But first, uh, Mike, why don't you uh, share a little bit about yourself uh, with the audience? Sure thing. Thanks for having me, Mark. So my name is Mike Pagonis. I'm the systems engineering director at Nutanix for our healthcare team. So any, any customers that are healthcare related, you know, that, that we interact with, those are under my purview. And as a, you know, I've been in the, in the IT industry for quite some time, but the vast majority has been supporting healthcare customers in some way, shape or form. So it's a little about me. Thank you. Absolutely, great to have you. So we're going to talk about a favorite topic of mine, which is the patient experience. Now, whenever this topic comes up, I think of the great classic parable from India of the six blind men and the elephant, where the king somehow had six blind advisors and asked them, directed them to a different part of an elephant and asked them to describe the elephant. And so, of course, we all know one touched the trunk and one touched the tusk and one touched the foot and one touched the tail. And each of them came up with a very, a description of a really different animal. So I think of that when I think of the patient experience because ask 10 people in healthcare, what is the patient experience? You will get 20 answers. Um, let's start with, what do you think the patient experience is, Mike? Like, how do you define it? In this context, and, and we're going to quickly talk about what happened during the pandemic with the patient experience, but when, when you encompass the term, what does it say to you? Yeah, so patient experience is, is interesting because, you know, I think it kind of, is, it's kind of a two-pronged approach. You have, a, you have a customer experience, you have a patient experience, and they all kind of intersect in the same place, which is, you know, as an individual, as patients or customers, we're looking for the best possible experience for us whenever we go to uh, the doctor's office or we're out shopping and, and we're looking for convenience and reliability and, and what's the most flexible for me. And, uh, and, and as an organization, we're looking at ways to, to make our customers or patients feel more comfortable and, and, and coming in to visit with us because that puts us in a position where we're, we're trying to help the customer make a long-term decision to come back and visit us again. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that happened during the pandemic was it kind of scrambled everything up and rearranged things in people's minds, right? Um, as we all know, patient care organization leaders had to think very quickly about how they delivered care. We had to think about infection. We had to think about safety in that context. And so very large portions of patient care were delivered remotely for the first time. You know, most patient care organizations had, you know, telehealth at like 1% of outpatient visits. And then suddenly in, in a week, it was 85%. Um, and one of the things that seems to have come out of that was, first of all, Patients liked it. They really liked remote, you know, I mean, for so many reasons, convenience. Um, and at the same time, the technology had already be, been advancing so that patients could self schedule doctor visits. There were a lot of things they could do. They could communicate with their providers in new ways. How do you think the pandemic impacted not only the patient experience as lived by consumers slash patients, but as lived by uh, patient care organization leaders. What, how do you think it reframed things for us? 
Yeah, you're, you know that you bring up a good point in that we've we've had the tools on our phones and tablets and in other places to help schedule visits. But uh, but now all of a sudden we were kind of forced into that position of, you know, how do I get my information? And uh, so those tools, some of the tools were there, but people just weren't used to using them. And, and, and I'll tell you, as, as a patient um, of, of a couple of different doctors for different things, it, it actually simplified my life because now I had the ability to rapidly schedule an appointment, schedule follow-ups. And, and I'm one of those people that lives and dies by my calendar. So I'll schedule the next three or four appointments if, if, if I have that many to worry about. And, um, and then I'll go in on a regular basis to double check, to, you know, am, am I scheduled? Do I not, did I forget to put something in my calendar? And, um, but more importantly, I just had a, a test. So, you know, can I get my results? Do I have to go into the office to get my results? Well, as a, as a patient, now my results show up within 24 hours in some cases, in some right. cases, the same day. And that's the, so that, that rapid push of information to the patient has become a very important thing. And I think if you look at, if you look at how the industries evolved from paper charts into, you know, having a computer in, in the, in the diagnostic rooms or something of that nature, you know, that, that significantly improved the, the, the rate at which data was put into the, into the medical record, which meant that data was more rapidly available to the patients. And I think that, you know, if you throw the pandemic on there, it just, it made it completely blow up. And, and, and a lot of healthcare organizations were, they were in the process of implementing new technology to, to speed up things yeah. and to make the data more secure. And now all of a sudden it was, you know, shoved to the forefront of everybody's, you know, thoughts of, great, I can't, we can't go into the office. How do we communicate with each other? Okay, now we, we found a way to communicate. How do we rapidly get the data out? And then if you needed to take your information and go to a, a specialist with some information, it, that data is shared in a much more rapid fashion. So, so it actually created a lot of conveniences once people realized what they had available to them. Yeah, absolutely. So Mike, would you share with us uh, maybe just uh, a sample personal experience that you've had that kind of illustrates what you just been uh, talking about. Sure, sure. So, uh, so uh, being new to the Carolinas, uh, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, moved out to the Carolinas a little while back. Uh, a little something called allergy showed up on my in my life that I had never had issues with before, and uh, so you know, you, you take a bunch of over counter, counter medication, it doesn't help. I eventually went to an, an, an allergy doctor uh -huh. and I uh, went through all the testing and, um, and, and they had a shop clinic. So it was pretty convenient. You could come on these two days. Here's the time frame. You just show up and you walk in and you get your shot and you walk out. Uh, well, obviously you have to wait a little bit to make sure you don't have an allergic reaction, but, but all of a sudden everything shuts down and we, and everything locks down, uh, but people still needed to have aller you know, asthma treatments, allergy shots and things of that nature. So then it turned into, you would still call in and, uh, and you would set an appointment and uh, which wasn't bad because we were kind of used to that anyway, but they, but they rapidly shifted to a, um, an, an online check-in tool and management system. And so I would schedule my appointments through my phone uh, they would send me a text alert reminding me of my appointment and, uh, and they would give me my window. And, and so you would pull up, you'd pick up the phone and call, you know, if the, if they were busy, like in the beginning, it was extremely busy because it was a new concept. People couldn't get the phones to work. They didn't have the app. Yeah. Well, yeah. Fast forward a little bit. All of a sudden they have an app. You, you pull up, you punch the button to check in you know, you get an alert saying, okay, we're ready to see you. You put your mask on, you walk in, you validate some information. They give you your shot, schedule your next appointment, you walk out and, uh, and then you're, you're kind of off and about your business though. So for me, that's created a lot of convenience because my day can be a little crazy uh, at times. And so being able to have a, have a window to show up and then kind of do the, you know, use your app on your phone because we all have phones. 
Um, I kind of wish I had a flip phone at times because I have so much information available to me on my phone. But uh, but but you have the your that data data is right there at your fingertips. Yeah. How do you think now widening out from that very interesting personal experience to looking at this as an industry expert? What do you think that kind of experience says to you about the fact that um, so many uh, consumers have devices now? What what should the leaders of patient care organizations be thinking about in terms of how they interact meaningfully in this device-filled world now? I, th I think that's kind of an interesting lens through which we could look at this. No, you're you're right. I, the um, so in, in a in an end user uh, end user computing world. So kind of you know going back to the paper chart, meeting with the patient face to face scribbling some notes, you know, you're talking into a microscope and a microphone to, to kind of to capture notes, you know, audibly and then replaying those and then and then inputting that data into a chart that somebody else types in for you is, you know, it's very time consuming. It, it changes things from a billing perspective. Um, but with the adoption of end user computing, now doctors are walking into or clinicians in, in general are walking into in their patient rooms with a, uh, you know, at, at the point of care with a, with either a tablet or a, a, a computer, information goes in very rapidly yeah. and customers have instant access to that information. So, so uh, to me, I think that's created a little more one-on-one -on -one time with the patient yeah. and a better experience from a doctor or patient or clinician patient standpoint. And I can tell you that as a patient of a couple of different doctors, I appreciate that. I get a little bit more time but it also helps the doctor have access or the clinician have access to their information uh, at pretty, from pretty much anywhere and in a secure manner. So, yeah. you know, you're no longer loading up a box full of charts going home and transcribing information. You now have, a, you know, a computer at home, but your data is kept in your data center in a secure manner. Doctors can come in remotely, update their information and immediately publish it out to the patients. But from a patient perspective, the, the question and concern is how can I make sure that I'm delivering their information to them in a rapid manner, but also keeping it secure? Because, you know, that's, if you look at a medical record, there's a lot of really valuable information in there. And um, so not just a social security number. Now you have eye color, hair color, um, ethnicity, all those, all the additional bio information that, that somebody could use to create some you know, to kind of piece data together, yeah. it's, it's out there. So how can we keep it more locked down, more secure? Um, I've seen some healthcare facilities putting in kiosks for people to, you know, to come in and schedule their appointments for people that just don't feel comfortable using a phone or something of that nature. But, but these apps that are showing up in phones, uh, Epic is one of the ones that I use on a regular basis and they're, and they're my chart. Is, is great because it's a secure connection from my phone into their gateway that takes me into their data center. And I have no clue that that all these backend things are happening, but as a patient, I know I can click the button, schedule an appointment. I can even jump into a patient or, you know, a doctor meeting, you know, right from my phone. Yeah. So I want to go down both of those forks of the road, one after the other, if we could. Uh, how do, what should, patient care organizations leaders think about security? How should they frame security of data? And then we'll talk about the patient experience. Sure, so, so uh, securing the data, the, the first thing that, we, that we've started to see, and, and actually it's, it's created a lot of activity uh, because of the pandemic. I think it, it accelerated yeah. a lot of these efforts, which is great because now where there's less chance of, of data sitting on a laptop in somebody's car. The, and it might be stolen. Now the data is housed in the data center behind locked key, you know, locked doors, locked windows. It's typically secure badge access, maybe some, you know, biometric scanner type thing to let you in. So the data is in a, it's like in a vault that, uh, that it takes, it's going to take a lot of effort to get in and, and probably not something somebody's going to do. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one aspect of it. And, and by using end user computing, it, it puts the data in a locked facility. Yeah. Now, step two, uh, we're seeing an evolution in how we secure the, the end user devices. So 
before you had a firewall sitting at the edge of your network and it was it would allow data to go out but not data or people to come in and um and i guess the important thing to say is that the um the only way to to truly secure your data is to never plug it in but that that doesn't actually that doesn't work in the real world yeah so what you do is you take a layered approach to protecting patient information and and our access so you implement things like you still have firewalls but you also do firewalls between you know the 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 machines within your your network so you do kind of like a a multi-layered moat approach. So it's like you have different gates of access to get into your to get into your data, but to the end user, you don't realize these things are happening. You just know that instead of using a password, now maybe I have two-factor authentication. So I type in a user ID and a password, and then I have to then I have to use an app on my phone or a some kind of device to you know something you have to say to, to basically say hey this is really me. Um, yeah. So that's that's one way, and then you take it a step further. And you only allow certain information systems to talk to each other. So it's not just a wide open network. Because once you compromise a firewall and if everything's wide open, you're able to move around freely without anybody ever knowing. So now this multifaceted um, you know, network micro segmentation approach of keeping all VMs don't talk to all VMs or all servers don't talk to yeah. all servers. It's everything is shielded from each other except for those that need to talk. And then we limit it to only certain forms of communication. So only certain network ports are allowed to talk instead of you know a wide open broadcast. Yeah. And so how so how do we communicate all that in a very simple way to patients so that they feel uh, confident in these communications? And how do we? I don't want to use the word train. That's a bad word in this context. How do we prepare? clinicians as they uh, have visits and encounters with patients so that they can also say, yes, your data is secure, right? Yeah, I think there's an, there's an educa internal education approach and a, a lot of IT organizations are having those discussions with their, their, their staff and letting them know that this is the process that we're doing, our data is secure, there are certain standards that we have to follow, and a lot of it starts with the Department of Defense, and we've adopted a lot of those technologies. Um, and then, uh, but these are some extra things that we need you to do, like we need you to be mindful of when you walk out of a room that you tap out. So some organizations use tap and go, so they use, you know, uh, proximity cards or some kind of biometric scanner to log in. And, and having those things still integrated into the system or, or newly integrated in the system allows them to, you know, prove and show patients. Because when I go into the doctor's office, I don't, I see the, I see the doctor, you know, put the finger on the finger scanner, they badge in and all of a sudden the screen unlocks. But the moment that they back away from the computer, it's almost, it, it's set to automatically lock itself down. Mm -hmm. So, so doctors and clinicians are doing a really good job of, of being mindful of their data. And so yeah. that way it doesn't stay up and running. And IT staff are also doing things like putting in timeouts. So if you haven't interacted with this computer within you know, 60 seconds, we're gonna go ahead and automatically lock the screen and then log the doctor out. So, yeah. so, so they're taking kind of a multifaceted approach there. Uh, as far as conveying that to the patients, I think when they see us go through the process of all of the different login methodologies and things that we're doing to, to get access to the data, that's a good start. But I think um, I've also been handed some leaflets from some of my doctors saying, hey, this yeah. is some of, these are some of the things we're doing to help secure your information. You know, yeah. It probably doesn't get into the nuts and bolts of how they do it, but they tell us, hey, you know, we have your data secure. We follow HIPAA guidelines. And yeah. um, when you use these applications, you know, to access your information, it's encrypted communications, and uh, and it may ask you for some some you know identifiable information to corroborate who you are. Yeah, that makes sense. How do we handle the uh, IT governance and project management aspects of tiering? T i e r i n g as opposed to tearing like we'll cry <laughs> these uh these right exactly these technologies some people will be tearing but but 
you know, how do we make sure that we're stepping into this in a way that makes clinicians and patients feel comfortable so that they don't feel, I mean, we want the data, we want the uh, technology, but we also don't want to feel kind of like overwhelmed and shocked by it, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the I think the the good thing is the IT staff is thinking about. I mean, when I work with a customer, I don't I don't walk in and say, okay, let me figure out how to make this really complicated from a security aspect, and then right. let my patients and and clinicians deal with that. Uh, yeah. What I do is, I think about how do I implement new security countermeasures, and uh, in an effective way, but shield the I or shield the clinicians and patients from seeing that. I, I want them to know there's complexity in the system, but I don't want them to have to deal with or interface with the complexity. It should yeah. be very simple and transparent to the to the patient and the clinicians, and uh, and the IT staff is is they're really designed to to think in that manner, and um, and and because of you know pivots in the industry and and COVID really shining a light on some of these things. They're, they're rapidly adopting and, and, and trying to think of how can we make everybody else's life easier. It might make our life more complicated, but that means our data is more, sent, is more secure. And, uh, and, and I think actually every customer I've talked to is, is thinking that way, and they have been for some time. And uh, you know, all of a sudden, government funding becomes available and it allow, it's allowed for a more rapid adoption of some of these technologies. And, and if you think about, you know, some of the news that we're seeing about ransomware, you know, yeah. I will tell you that I've participated in some meetings with the FBI and lots of healthcare organizations have also been participating and yeah. because they're, we're all communicating together to find ways to, to be more secure with information and lock it down. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredibly important. So the next few years, you look at this constellation of tools you know, self-scheduling, um, automated bill pay, uh, telehealth, uh, and electronic visits, um, and others. What, how will things play out in the next few years with the development of these tools and with their integration into a, bro a bigger whole? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so... Um... So one of the things we've seen in the industry is, and when I say the industry, the IT industry, um, the increased security countermeasures, you know, locking down the information, just in, introducing additional um, protection points at different vectors within the IT silo has created some strain on, on the system. And the good thing is, you know, we can keep scaling, we can keep adding more you know, processors and memory and all the, all the other, you know, fun nerd knobs that I like to play with. But, um, but at the end of the day, it creates a it creates some contention within the IT silo. And uh, so over the next couple of years, improvements in memory technology, CPU technology, it, it's going to, it's going to significantly increase the performance. And, uh, and I can tell you, we're starting to see some of that technology now. So any slowdowns in the system should start disappearing pretty rapidly. And, um, but, but in addition to that, I think if you look at the, the devices and tools that are being created, are, are, they're being designed with the security and performance built in. So because those are being designed into these systems, it's, it's, not, it's not manifesting itself as a slowdown for right. the doctor or right. a clinician. Which is a good thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, as we close, I'd like to ask you to share advice with our audience for all the things we've been talking about, and any other closing thoughts. I'm sure you probably have some insights and thoughts that I haven't yet touched on. Yeah. So one of the things that I think I would share is that, as a, as an IT person, sometimes we're well. Let's just say that a, a lot of a lot of IT people are not in the hospitals, they're working from remote because we wanted to free up space or the, the, the medical community made a decision to free up space for, for patients coming in and out. And uh, it, because, you know, we have to do, we have additional, you know, protection and PPE and things that we have to store and, 
and, and how do we you know make the ventilation better in the building? So we had to make some changes to to rapidly adopt or adapt to this uh, to the pandemic. But but I, what I would say is, you know, befriend your IT people. Ask them, you know, what are they doing? Uh, help me understand what you know what we're doing to make our information more secure. So that way, when a patient asks me, I can turn around and relay some great information. So I would say that that is a big thing is, you know, talk to your IT staff um, is, is probably the first step. Second step as a, as a clinician or a patient, I would say that we need to, you know, you know, utilize the tools, uh, spend some time understanding the tools and how, and, and see how it simplifies your life. Uh, I'm just, I'm kind of an information junkie. So I sat down and I'm, you know, every time I log into my chart or one of these other, you know, remote tools to schedule meetings or look at my patient information, I learned something new. Uh, I, <laughs> to be honest, I forgot to put a, a, a calendar invite in my, in my scheduler for a, for a meet or for a patient visit. And, uh, and I was freaking out because I knew I had one coming up, but I couldn't remember the day or the time and I knew I was getting close. So I went digging through my chart to figure out, oh, great, I have, a, I have an appointment. It's with my, you know, dietitian. It's so it was a. There's a lot of great information in there at our fingertips. It's secure, and yeah. um, it's protected from the point it leaves your phone till the point where it gets into the data center, behind locked doors, through firewalls, and all these other security countermeasures. So it's it's a secure form of communications, and 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 we keep the technology keeps getting better, so the security gets stronger, while yet performing even better. So, you know, use the tools. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good message to be able to share. Um, the next couple of years, what do you think will happen? You know, so the, obviously I have this big crystal ball right here that tells me everything that's coming. So, uh, no, no, it's uh, what I would say is that from a, what do I see happening in the future? I don't necessarily know that we fully go back to what we were used to. I think a lot of a lot of patients uh, have found this change or, or pivot in the industry as something very, very enticing and attractive, and it's yeah. given them freedom. And I think the the healthcare organizations that that truly think about you know our patients and their experience with us, you're going to create a lifelong patient, and yeah. and that's the important piece. If I can, can if I take care of you so well and give you access. Yeah to your information on your terms, you'll want to work with me more. And, and then you're going to refer your friends and family to me as well, which is also yeah. part of building your practice and healthcare organization. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think, you know, no, nobody on earth wanted a global pandemic, right? But um, we're learning a lot about what patients slash consumers want. You know, and I, I remember writing for a different publication literally 30 years ago, a cover story on uh, growing healthcare consumer empowerment. <laughs> you know, this is the moment. Well, this is finally the moment, <laughs> 30 years later. And I think that smart people like you are helping to lead us forward. We, we have a great opportunity here. You know, necessity is the mother of invention and all of that stuff. And I think some of what you've been sharing has really been speaking to, there's a lot of opportunity for leaders of patient care organizations to create what the marketing people love to call sticky relationships in a yes. good way. Yes, I, I completely agree. It's a, you know, I, as an IT person, I think I've been preaching that it's going to be the year of VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure for seven or eight years. And, and this past year, the those that had already adopted some form of end user computing or virtual desktop infrastructure, they were, they were ahead of the game and, and they were able to scale from a couple of thousand offices or, you know, clinicians to thousands of clinicians in a very rapid time. And a lot of companies or a lot of healthcare organizations are, are doing that. And it's impressive to see how their patient experience, you know, or to see the patient experience change with that adoption. So, uh, I'm excited as an IT person to see how what I do impacts the healthcare organization and helps create that sticky, you know, patient relationship. 
which is wonderful. And I, you know, I've been predicting um, since the time that I had hair uh, that we would reach this moment in healthcare where patient care organization leaders would actually think about the patient as a consumer and not just as this body that gets wheeled in and, you know, we take care of parts, right? So. Very good. Yeah, no, you're right. I bet you were making predictions when you still had hair too. Well, so That's what made all the hair fall out was just right, the active, yeah. the active the you know, brain activity. <laughs> the stress of it all, yes. Well, Mike, this has been absolutely wonderful. You, I've learned a lot and I know it's been very helpful to our audience. So thank you so much for your wisdom and your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This has been a wonderful, a wonderful conversation. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, our publisher, Matt Rayner, has magically reappeared. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And, and thank you, Michael. A big thank you to the Nutanix team for their support yeah. of this program. Uh, we now have a roughly one hour break. We'll be resuming here at 2 p.m. Eastern for the panel discussion, Trend Watch Digital Health Prescribing. So we look forward to seeing you all back here at 2 p.m. Eastern and we will resume the program then. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you.